And joining us now is Hisham El Nagar. He is professor of earthquake engineering at the University of Western Ontario in London. Thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you, Steve, Appreciate for having you being me here. here. Okay, a lot of background we need to understand here. First of all, magnitude 7 on the Richter scale of an earthquake. How does that compare to others you would typically study? The uh, magnitude scale is a logarithmic scale. So a magnitude 7 means it's 10 times stronger than a magnitude 6 earthquake, 100 times stronger than magnitude 5 earthquake. And to put that in perspective, a, an earthquake of magnitude 7 is roughly equivalent to having an atomic bomb of about one megaton power uh, detonated right underneath uh, Port-au-Prince. So that's how much energy was released during this kind of earthquake. That's interesting, because I do remember one observer saying it looks like an atom bomb hit this place, and I thought they might have been not being literal, but in fact you're saying they were. It's yeah, we the measure thing. the energy of the earthquake, the energy released during the earthquake the, that triggers the seismic waves that cause the damage. And it is about that much for this particular earthquake. How deep was this quake? Uh, the focal point, that's where the energy earthquake started releasing, uh, was about uh, 10, 11 kilometers below the ground surface. Is that typical? It is very shallow. It is shallow. It's shallow. Yeah, that's most why it was deeper. Uh, most earthquakes would be deeper. Uh, the destructive ones were, are characterized by shallow uh, focal points like the one we are talking about now. Um, typically, it would go anything between 10 and uh, as deep as 100 kilometers, sometimes deeper. And depth so, matters because why? Because the distance the seismic waves uh, travels up to the point of incidence will matter in terms of how much energy is transferred with it. Uh, so the closer the focal point is to a point uh, where you have your building, it means the waves will come with full energy, not weakened, not attenuated, because as the seismic waves travel through the soil or rock, it loses some of its strength, and we call that attenuated. So if the travel distance is much longer, then the attenuation is larger, and then you expect the earthquake energy arriving at the point of interest where you have a building or you have population okay. would be less than you expect the damage to be less. Just so I get this, so it, <clears throat> is it, was it a 7 in part because it was so close to the surface or could, you, could it have been 100 kilometers below and still have been a 7 as well? Well, the magnitude is measured by the trace measured at a certain location uh, using a certain seismograph in millimeters, so in logarithmic uh, measure of the displacement of that seismograph. So depending on where you measure that, that would be the magnitude. And that's a little bit different than what we call intensity of the earthquake. So if you have the earthquake of a magnitude 7, that means it released sufficient energy to move the ground and measure an amplitude of a certain amount of millimeters, but the area affected by the earthquake is far along such that the energy arriving at this location is much less, then the buildings will not see as much damage, uh, there is no uh, fatalities, no injuries, then we say the intensity of the earthquake at a certain location is less. I see. So okay. there is a difference between the magnitude as a measure of how much movement due to the earthquake uh, seismic waves, and the intensity, intensity, which is the observations we make with regard to the damage due to that earthquake. Okay. We, anybody who knows California knows about the San Andreas Fault. What's yes. the fault that, that uh, Port-au-Prince is on? Uh, the, similar, the same mechanism uh, that triggers earthquakes in California, which is a strike-slip mechanism where two tectonic plates move relative to each other. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens here where you have the Caribbean uh, tectonic plate and the North American tectonic plate moving relative to each other, uh, releasing this kind of energy. And uh, Enricola uh, Plantain Garden, that's the name of the uh, fault line where this earthquake was initiated. And again, we know that the San Andreas fault line moves frequently. Does yes, this one as well? Yes, and this one does move uh, frequently. Uh, as a matter of fact, they had an earthquake uh, in this area only uh, two years ago, less than two years, actually, mm -hmm. uh, but was in uh, the uh, Dominican Republic. It did not cause as much damage, and it did co not cause as much um, fatalities. This time, it is shallower. The focal point is shallow, and also the epicenter is much closer 
to a very densely populated area, which is the capital, uh, Port-au-Prince. That's why we see such uh, intense damage, lots of uh, building shaking and falling. Another aspect that actually led to this very significant damage that uh, the uh, land of Haiti is mostly soil deposits as opposed to being rock. Mm -hmm. uh, soil deposits tend to move uh, during an earthquake shaking and at times uh, amplify uh, the uh, ground shaking. So if the energy released would cause certain amount of movement, as the seismic wave travels through the soil deposit, will amplify, and by the time it arrives at the ground surface, it's much stronger. So the intensity of the shaking is stronger, and then the buildings sitting on top of the ground surface at this location will experience more ground movement, and that will lead to uh, significant damage in the buildings. Yeah, we've all seen the pictures on television about how the, the buildings there have all just pancaked as a result of the, the earthquake there. But I want to get a sense about um, if the same kind of earthquake had happened, let's say, in Vancouver, would the results have been the same? No. Why not? Because the building designs and construction we apply in Vancouver are much different than uh, what we saw in Port-au-Prince. Uh, when an expert looks at the type of damage and the nature of damage that took place with the building, falling, as you mentioned, pancaking, I call them like house cards falling down, that tells me that the sections of the columns supporting the buildings weren't designed properly, were not constructed properly. In Canada, we have, as part of our uh, National Building Code, we have seismic provisions where the structure engineers will have to design the buildings to uh, withstand certain types of fluids, certain levels of fluids, according to the seismic hazard in the area where that building is located, but also dictate certain amount of reinforcement to be used in the what we call the seismic resisting system. So if we have seismic resisting uh, system made of uh, columns and beams, mm -hmm. then they must be enforced in a certain way, certain amount of reinforcement in a certain shape to accommodate the seismic forces. Uh, my observations from the images that came from Port-au-Prince, it tells me that that wasn't the case. So their design was a little bit different. So even if you'd had a seven on the Richter scale earthquake in Port-au-Prince, if the building standards had been higher and the engineering had been superior, much of this could have been avoided. Exactly. Actually, that brings to mind um, another earthquake that took place uh, was very much the same magnitude. The uh, Kobe earthquake in Japan, 1995. Mm -hmm. It happened pretty much the same time as well, actually. Mm -hmm. January 17th, 95. Uh, the magnitude was very similar to this one, if not a little bit stronger. It was 7.4. Uh, but the amount of damage that took place wasn't as bad as this one. Yes, they had damage. The focal point was also shallow, and the epicenter wasn't too far. Uh, but the buildings were designed and constructed according to the uh, seismic provisions of the Japanese code, mm -hmm. so the buildings survived the earthquakes. And actually, there came some images from there were very telling, very interesting. You see three different types of buildings in one picture. Uh, old uh, wooden houses, uh, Japanese-type wooden houses, and then you have a reinforced concrete building, and then you have a high-rise steel and uh, glass buildings, and they're actually situated next to each other. And you see the, uh, the traditional wooden house was demolished to the ground. The reinforced concrete building that was uh, constructed in 1960s collapsed, but not really bad. Mm -hmm. And then the modern building that was designed and constructed according to most recent seismic provisions in the Japanese code wasn't even cracked. So in one picture, in one neighborhood, subjected to the same earthquake at the same time, you would see very significant difference in terms of performance. So the wooden house went totally. The concrete building was designed a little bit better than the wooden house, but it's not up to the standard we have right now. It failed, but it didn't kill the uh, inhabitants. Mm -hmm. And the modern building didn't even crack. Interesting. W would the engineering and building standards employed in Haiti be typical for the region, worse than the region? What do you, how would you gauge them? 
I'm not very familiar with the engineering practices in the region, but looking at how the buildings perform, I suspect they're the worst kind. I mean, the worst kind. Yeah, when I uh, look at uh, masonry uh, buildings where no reinforcement in the walls, and the walls are uh, designed to take the load uh, during earthquake shaking, if the masonry walls do not have any reinforcement in them, they just break and they fall down like we've seen in the images coming uh, uh, on the TV. I also look at the failure pattern for reinforced concrete buildings and I see columns breaking at the middle, which is very typical of lack of what we call confinement reinforcement for the column. Mm -hmm. And also we see failures at the connection between a column and a beam. And that is typical of the lack of reinforcement, confinement reinforcement at this joint. And also short splices connecting between the beam and column. So in the event of an earthquake, a building starts to shake in the lateral direction. If there is no means to carry the load between the column and the beam, this connection will tend to fail. And as soon as it fails, it falls down. So as I said, it will fall down like a house of cards. Yeah. And you don't want to be underneath uh, such uh, roof, right? And that would happen to the poor people in Haiti. Hmm. Uh, here's from today's National Post. It was the crushing poverty in the hemisphere's poorest nation that resulted in Port-au-Prince being a city of ramshackle homes of unreinforced concrete or worse, shanties assembled of odd-shaped bits of rusty corrugated metal, scrap wood, cardboard, and old uh, packing crates. It was decades of neglect that made rebar, that's reinforcing steel, an unaffordable luxury for virtually all on the island, or that left communications, power, and water systems so underdeveloped that even prior to the earthquake, they were operating at what even other poor nations would consider crisis levels. I mean, I know you're not an expert in Haitian history, but we've all sort of got a crash course in the last few days on how things work there. Why should we think that uh, they will pay any more attention to engineering and building and construction and code details going forward than they did in the past? Poverty is still there. Honestly, it's not just now poverty. It is the survival of the nation. We know that Haiti lies in a very seismic active area where you have this uh, fault that's active, producing very significant earthquakes. Probably this is the strongest in the last, let's say, 100 years. But that doesn't mean it's the last one. Uh, you may anticipate stronger earthquakes coming. And if the earthquake that hit uh, Dominican Republic it was a magnitude 8. If this particular earthquake was magnitude 8, it could have leveled the entire city and vanished the entire population. If you look at an earthquake that's 10 times stronger hitting this city with the same building practices, mm -hmm. what do you expect uh, even damage? If you, OK, but even if you improve the code, we know that governance is a problem in Haiti. And presumably, building inspectors and officials get bribed all the time. So again, is there any reason to suspect that things will improve going forward? Well, if, if we learn from history, we should learn from this particular one because the magnitude of the uh, tragic uh, events that took uh, the entire population here, we have almost 3 million people rendered homeless due to the earthquake. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, number of dead exceeds 100,000, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But that is a very uh, realistic estimate of the anticipated casualty. And I'm actually worried about what happens afterwards, not just the people who died during the earthquake, but as you just mentioned, the basic uh, life needs are not there. Uh, they have a very limited uh, clean water resources to start with. Now with the earthquake, I suspect all the uh, main water uh, pipes were broken during the earthquake, the main uh, power supply cables were cut during the earthquake. So even the makeshift hospitals don't have clean water. They don't have uh, limited electricity to run any equipment they need. What do you expect for people to happen? And if decaying bodies start to spread the disease, then you expect even worse situation. I'm really afraid for what is going to happen in the coming weeks and months. Indeed. Thank you for coming in and telling us about it tonight. Hisham El Nagar, professor of earthquake engineering at UWO. You have a perfect last name for your job. El Nagar, Arabic for the carpenter. Right on. All right. Thank you for coming in again. Thank you.